Welcome to Bloombox Growing Deeper. I'm Sarah. I'm Hannah. And we're on a mission to help you become the gardener you want to be. Happy New Year, everybody, and welcome to Bloombox Growing Deeper. We're excited to help you garden in this new year, especially if you made a resolution to garden more. Perhaps you did. The studies that are coming out show that a lot of people are planning to garden more. So we're excited to be here and to help you do that. And today we have a great list of plants, trees, shrubs, grasses, all kinds of things that are going to help you garden better in 2023. And of course, Sarah and I couldn't do this alone. So we have asked Bob, everyone knows Bob, (laughs) to be here to talk about great plants of 2023. So Bob, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure. I am Bob Henriksen. I am Horticulture Program Coordinator with the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. So tell Mm -hmm. us some of the things you do for NSA, because you do a lot of things. Yeah, well, you know, probably the main thing I do is grow the plants that that we offer for our membership, for the general public at plant sales. So um, I grow a variety of things from trees and shrubs to uh, herbaceous perennials, wildflowers, that being, and, and grasses. And then offer those for sales um, starting in the spring and running all the way through the summer and fall seasons. So we're actually gearing up here in 2023 already uh, for next year or this year. (laughs) Yeah. Well, really, you started in December. Right. Sowing seed that needed um, a stratification. Yes. And along with the growing, one of the things you do a lot of then is educating people about uh, the plants that you grow and how to utilize them in the landscape. So... Tell us a little bit about what the Great Plants Program is, and um, I know it started way before Hannah and I, so tell us where it came from. Right. Well, this started back in 1998, which is just weird to say now, but yeah, 1998, and it's, it's a plant promotion program. Okay, so we were alive. Yes, you were here. You, you, you just weren't <laughs> quite here yet, right? Okay, but yeah, in 1998, and it, this was started before I arrived here as well, you know, and the, the whole kind of the, the whole take, the whole shtick with the Great Plants Program is introducing people to plants uh, that were going overlooked, underutilized, weren't really making it their way into people's gardens. Yet we knew these plants uh, would do well if people just knew about them. So the idea was to use this as a, a recommendation, if you will, uh, a yearly recommendation. But we didn't. They did just want to have one plant, you know, a, as a plant of the year. They decided let's do categories of plants because there's so many different categories. So there's a tree of the year. Uh, and within that, there's a conifer of the year, so an evergreen. And then there's a grass of the year, a perennial of the year, a shrub of the year. Wanted to do vine of the year, but we stopped it at five of them. And I think that's an, that's enough categories uh, for people to find some awesome plants. And there's a cumulative list uh, that has been kept uh, since 1998 of the, the winners every year. And so 2023 is no different. We have some outstanding uh, winners to recommend for people's gardens that are, if they're, if they're not new to you, um, you know, hopefully you will find a place in your garden for them. And NSA, we don't run this program alone. It's a partnership with the Nebraska Nursery and Landscape Association. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a partnership with them has been since the get go. And we publish a physical magazine Mm -hmm. to go with this highlighting the plants of the year and then some other, you know, pertinent topics to the year. I know this year we've got an article on recognizing invasive species, some things on, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, lack of rain, stuff like that. So we will link to the magazine so you can um, check it out. But we will briefly highlight the plants of the year for 2023. And then if we have time, maybe we'll go back and look at some of our past favorites. Um, Before we start that, can you tell us the qualifications for being the plant of the year? Because they're not all native. um, They're not all, you know, absent from the big box store nurseries but what you know what what makes us choose yeah and sometimes they're a little harder to find i mean one of the uh, components of that plant of the year is that it does be available from wholesale nurseries Mm -hmm. 
Um, that being said, you know, we can't guarantee every retail outfit is going to be carrying that plant that we're recommending. We just hope people learn about them more often. And so the qualifications are it must be available, um, that it's a relatively new plant to the gardening world. So, for example, we're not just going to promote a daylily, for example, or a new hosta or something like that, because they don't, they're, they're already getting the attention they deserve. This is uh, highlighting those plants that are overlooked and underutilized. So it has to be a relatively new plant to the, the gardening world. Of course, it has to have outstanding features for the garden. Um, kind of a low impact plant, meaning uh, it shouldn't take much for supplemental irrigation to keep this plant going, um, shouldn't require fertilization or doesn't have insect or disease problems. You know, kind of the, you know, a good dependable fail safe plant basically is what we're, we're after highlighting. And then what we do is we ask the members of NNLA, first I, I ask a number of gardening professionals to, to help me come up with a nomination list. And then once we narrow that nomination list down to three candidates per category, then we have members of Nebraska Nursery and Landscape Association vote on those. And then the, the winners of that voting are the ones that end up being that plant of the year. And before we get into it, we do have extra copies of this publication. So if you would like a printed copy, you can just give us a call, email, and we'll be happy to send some to you. And it is written differently than most of our publications. This one crosses a little bit. It is definitely has some interest to the public in our highlighted plants, but we touch on some topics in our articles that may be of interest to industry members as well. So if it's something that you, if you have an association of landscapers um, and you'd like to provide some to your members, that's right. something we can help you with. Right. Um, it, it's a it's a fun thing for us to put together because it's a slightly different audience than right. than all of our publications. So. For sure, and like one of the th things you have in this uh, this year's piece is the the grants that are available to help communities plant uh, plant Nebraska, mm -hmm. which we do every single day. <laughs> all right, should we get into these plants? Let's do it. Let's do it. Starting with perennial of the year. All right, Bob, tell us about the perennial of the year, which is iron butterfly ironweed. Yeah, this is a, a Vernonia species. The ironweeds, you know, in Nebraska, I believe we have only two species native to the state, um, western ironweed and then Baldwin's ironweed. Uh, this one, uh, narrowleaf ironweed is another common name for it. I think the iron butterflies, to be honest with you, I've looked up, so who came up with that name? Who named it, right? And I couldn't find any information on that. I'm still curious, but that is more of an Arkansas, Oklahoma native. Certainly has uh, proven itself hardy in, in zone four climates, which we are in Nebraska. The, the, the coldest is zone four. But this, this selection iron butterfly came out of uh, Dr. Alan Armitage's trials. And Dr. Armitage has trials, I believe, down at the University of Georgia, if I remember right i think if you were a student in horticulture armitage is his book right everybody had and so i trust his word that it's a good plant um, so that's really when we started looking at this thing uh this narrow leaf ironweed going wow i wonder if it's as tough as all the other ironweeds because i think that's what ironweeds have they weren't really thought of in people's gardens well first of all the name i mean think of it ironweed come on i mean it's a it weed. It sounds like something that you could never get rid of. <laughs> right, right. But if you've ever grown it, folks, you know it's got that vibrant purple color that you really can't duplicate in the garden. And, you know, everybody wants to plant things to benefit, to help shore up our nation's biodiversity, you know, plant for pollinators and whatnot. And the iron weeds are some of the top notch for that. And I think they also kind of fill a niche where it's hard to find a plant that's going to bloom in late summer. Uh, kind of before the aster show and, and the mums, you know, and, and, and things come on in, in October, there's kind of this, this transition time between the summer blooming perennials and the fall blooming perennials. And I think iron weeds really fit that bill for that late summer. And so this iron butterflies, what it's got though, is it's called narrow leaf for a reason. The leaves are very um, narrow and gives it a nice fine texture. If people are familiar with that, um, Amsonia, the, uh, the, the threadleaf blue star, 
very similar in appearance to that. However, it lacks that yellow fall color that you would get with a Threadleaf Blue Star, but very similar texture. But at the time when your Amsonias are turning yellow, your ironweed's still blooming. Right, so right. This one came across my, came to my attention about two years ago, and I started using it pretty heavily in bloom box. Um, because iron weeds are phenomenal for our pollinators and, um, you know, the jury's not in yet on if this one's as tough as some of our natives. I'm, right. I'm still feeling that out. It appears to be so far. Right, right. But it's small. You know, some of our right. native um, and the more common iron weeds are, are large plants. Right. <laughs> and this one is a little guy only. I mean, I think, I think mine did get slightly over three feet, but not much. And right. it had pretty perfect growing conditions did it stay like a nice rounded plant you know it's a first year plant Uh so it's pretty gangly so i'm i'm kind of we'll wait on that yeah exactly yeah um, i think it'll yeah because that's what i've noticed too it's first year it's going to be a little gangly for you it's it's going to take probably two or three seasons real good growing years for it to really reach its mature stage i think and but one thing i found is it's very easy and i think that's one of the goals of the great plants program Mm -hmm. is I don't want to say plant it and forget it, but you darn near can. I did. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I, it's even p- planted right by where I park my car. I think I might have watered it twice after yeah. I planted it. And that was this summer <laughs> when it right, didn't when get any rain. Didn't get any rain. So yeah. I, I'm i ready to, to be pretty happy with it. It also gave me my favorite insect picture of the summer. Oh, really? I, I will share the picture, but I have this, there's this teeny tiny spider just chilling in the flower it looks like it's lounging in an armchair with its little spider head poking out was it a cute little crab spider by is, chance is that or? those little tiny white ones yeah they're, they're white ones and they kind of looks like yes. crab claws on them yes. yeah so it just looked like it was just like lounging in this flower yeah. chair so that's my favorite picture from the summer i haven't got to share it because it's not a pollinator so it hasn't ah. come up in conversation yet oh it's a part of the mix <laughs> though i what i love about crab spiders is they can change colors according to the uh yeah if it's on a white flower it'll be white a bunch of yellow flower be yellow and they're, they're great ambush predators so and you can actually see youtube videos if you're really bored in life and you want to watch a crab spider <laughs> catch something or but, if uh, you just need a break <laughs> right or you just need a break well you know one thing about the, the iron weeds too the ones we have native to nebraska you often see in overgrazed pastures you know cattle don't graze it that's often why it's referred to as a weed because if the cows don't eat it it's a weed to a rancher right and so uh, we would call this as an increaser uh, in, in a rangeland setting. Well, this iron butterflies one, this thread leaf um, iron weed, narrow leaf iron weed, um, grows in Oklahoma, Arkansas, places like that. Not really too many states. It's it's native to a pretty small area. So I think just for posterity, uh, for the for perpetuating this species, it's worth us us folks planting them in the garden. Well, this one, though, is native to rocky outcroppings, floodplains, and gravel bars, which says to me... Sounds ideal for us. Right. <laughs> well, a, good for a rain garden. Yeah. You know, for the bottom of a rain garden. We know it's drought tolerant. It can take the drought, but it probably can also take periodic, uh, you know, wet times and flooding and whatnot. Well, and what people don't realize about rain gardens is you can't fill a rain garden with plants that aren't drought tolerant because... Right. The idea is that your rain garden isn't full all the time. You're not planting a pond. Right. And so ironweed, that's why we get a lot of goldenrods in our rain gardens, because they're things that will happily soak up the water, but will also be very tough when they don't have it. Right. Right. Very adaptable. Okay. So tree of the year. Oh, yeah. One of my favorites. Um, you know, in the, throughout the years, the Great Plants Program, I'd have to look back at the cumulative list, but I swear we have at least four four or five oaks that have won uh, tree of the year. Uh, while I'm chatting, you guys can look that up and see how many different oaks. But this year, the, the 2023 tree of the year is shingle oak. And shingle oak, is, I mean, it fits the great plants to a T because here's an oak that we know is it's a beautiful tree, first of all, um, probably one of the best trees for the Great Plains and Midwest. Yet, for some reason, it's overlooked and underutilized in the landscape. And if you look at the leaves of a shingle oak, you know, you might say, well, what? it doesn't even look like That's an oak. That's what I was going to ask. Is, yeah. it, is it, do people have a bias because it doesn't look like an oak? 
You know, I think I, it's got a cool leaf. It does, really cool leaf. It doesn't have that classic oak shape. Um, oh, how would you describe that? It almost looks like a bay laurel leaf, you know, um, something like that. No margins on it, smooth edge. It looks like the first leaf you learn how to draw. Yeah, right. <laughs> kind of a pointy oval. Yeah, kind of a pointy oval, right. And and very thick and leathery. Um, yeah. And and almost they can almost be wavy. Um, it really has a nice texture to it. And, you know, although the fall color is not often loud um it can be really nice i've seen some nice russet reds on it more often than not kind of a bronzy yellow um i've even seen them go you know like just just almost a brown like a tawny brown but one thing the shingle oak has is is marcescent leaves so those are leaves that don't drop right away in the fall they'll hold on to the tree oftentimes until spring so we see this tree as a good windbreak alternative as people are kind of scratching their head going what can i revitalize my windbreak because so many conifers aren't doing well in nebraska you know um it's hard to 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 justify the continued use of conifers in our windbreak alone so our idea when i say ours that collectively the statewide arboretum the nebraska forest service is let's mix up those windbreaks and start adding a few hardwood trees into there and i think the shingle oak is a perfect one for that well and even not full on windbreak situations, but visual screening in, in an urban setting. Right. People enjoy, you know, in the summer, their trees kind of block the view of maybe the traffic on the road right. or right into their neighbor's window. Yep. But then the leaves drop. Yep. Well, if you can hold on to some leaves and extend that screen time. That's, That's a, pretty valuable. Yeah, great point. In fact, I had a fellow that was looking for tree recommendations. He had lost a tree, and now when they sit on their deck, they're looking right into their neighbor's bay window. So he needed a 20-foot screen Awkward. yesterday. <laughs> right? Awkward, <laughs> right? It's like, how you doing? And anyway, he's like, okay. So I, we talked about evergreens. We talked about large shrubs. And then it, we just I talked him into a shingle oak for that reason because I said, you know, if you're out here in the spring or late fall, um, you can still enjoy that screen because the leaves are going to still be on there um, right until it when it leaves out and there's actually in downtown Lincoln um, George Pinkerton who is the down with the downtown Lincoln Association planted a number of shingle oaks downtown which I was pleased to see because prior to his arrival there wasn't a shingle oak planted downtown and it's kind of fun going by those trees and seeing how they're doing there's one right at the corner of 14th and O, <laughs> doing great <laughs> I've always wondered where the name Shingle Oak yeah. came from. And so when I read your description this year, I was like, it was actually named because it was used as a shingle or shake. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Because I mean, think about it. When those shake shingles came came out, it's like, well, I wonder what tree they used for that. And apparently they would, when they would split this to make the shake shingles, it would, it would split very narrow. You know, you could get a narrow shingle and, and you know, split it along those line along the, the ray lines, I guess, of that tree. Yeah. So... Um, not a very exciting name if you think about shingle oak. I mean, what does that mean, right? But yeah, it's got a great history, um, you know, for shake shingles. I always thought it was because of the, you know, the shape of the leaves because they have no mark or they're just a smooth margin. Uh -huh. And I was like, are they supposed to look like shingles? I don't really think right? they do. Exactly. I'm confused. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, oaks have a reputation as being slow growing and, I, and, and they're not as long as you plant smaller, in my opinion. But the shingle oak, in my opinion, is one of the faster growing of the oaks. Um, I would put it right up there with the red oak and the red oaks I consider pretty quick. Yeah, our, our buckley oak, Silas's little buckley oak, um, I think, grew a foot and a half this summer wow in the drought in i mean we drought. did we were we've been trying to keep this sure. tree going because sure. the last thing you want to do is kill your kid's tree but right uh, <laughs> right it grew like a significant amount wow. right um, through that drought right yeah. through that drought yeah. but we planted it very small i think mm. it was mm. it was a a generously called a one gallon tree when we planted it <laughs> right well i can tell you the the largest tree in the state we know of there's several on city unl city campus um actually a stone's throw from the stadium uh there's a hall not far from the stadium called bessie hall uh, named after charles bessie and on the east side of that uh, building is the the state champion the largest tree we know of in the state i would say it's no, oh, it's been a while since I've seen the tree, but it's probably, it's easily over 50 feet. That would be a big shingle oak for Nebraska. 
Yeah, I was going to ask, does it get as tall as our other oaks? I would say eventually it could. We just don't have enough older trees that were planted, you know, to be able to, to say that. But I would say in Nebraska, you could count on, oh, a 40, 40 to 45 foot tree with, with confidence, that, you know, and it's going to take, you know, 30 to 40 years to get there at that 40 foot tree. Did you count? I did, but I forgot. I think I counted. I think I counted that this is oak number seven wow. on the list. Wow! 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 Yeah, we've kind of gone oak crazy on the great plants list, but we're talking since 1998. So. And a lot of the reasons the oaks made those lists because they're an overlooked, underutilized group of trees. All right, should we move to shrub? Let's do. Let's do it. I'm excited for this shrub because I don't have any spirea, and maybe now's the time. <laughs> and I am not excited by this because I have a thousand spirea. So I am not excited by this. What's different Come about on, man. this spirea? Well, okay, and you had mentioned earlier that, you know, the great plants for the Great Plains, you know, it's plant recommendations, and we don't always recommend native plants. Um, however, we do hang our hat on mostly, and when we say native, we say we, we think regional native, you know, was it, you know, plants didn't draw borders, humans did. So if you look at that ironweed, for example, being native to Oklahoma, Arkansas, that's close enough in our book, and the shingle oak, you know, a southeastern U.S. native, it gets up to the, the St. Joseph, Missouri area, and that's it. So if you drive down to Kansas City, you see shingle oaks off in the, in the woods there. But this, this spirea, however, uh, Tor birch leaf spirea. And T O R, and I don't know why they named it Tor. Okay, I also read that wrong because I thought it was the Thor ver- birch leaf oh. spirea, which <laughs> I would vote for. Thor probably would have been a better name. <laughs> I don't know why they that, why they chose Tor. I'm, I'm I'm still curious about that. But um, this is one from China. It's a spirea from China, and you know. A lot of, you know, when you think of spireas, you're like, oh, that's like so 80s. And, you know, because they were popular in the 80s and really kind of went away in the 90s. And very few, if any, landscapers are planting spireas anymore. Um, And I suppose it was because, you know, they they took some regular maintenance, you know, and whatnot. But this this birch leaf spirea is is pretty new on the market. It actually was selected uh, by the popular nursery down in Oklahoma, Greenleaf Nursery. Well known amongst nursery professionals, Greenleaf is. And I trust, let's see, I think their plant program is called Garden Debut. So this one de- debuted in their, amongst their, Ooh. yeah, right? <laughs> this one they debuted as a, as a new spirea for the garden. Well, what it's got, you know, if you've noticed, some spireas can get really awesome fall color, but nobody can compare to this Taurus spireas. I've seen um, really a mixture of three or four different colors on one group of shrubs, you know, where it can be, you know, russet reds, yellows, oranges, um, burgundies, um, all on the same shrub. It's really, uh, really delicious in fall color. And we all know Hannah loves fall, so mm-hmm. this is probably making it into the garden. Yes, yes. It, You know, and it's not very big. You know, I would say full grown, three by three feet. Um, and the foliage is very attractive as well. Even when it's not in, in fall color, th- the name birch leaf spirea is aptly named. And I suppose somebody squinted their eyes and thought it looked like a birch and said, well, okay, it looks like a good name to me. Joe, let's call it birch leaf spirea. No, but um, I've noticed they really like naming things birch leaf. Yeah, right. Like birch leaf this and birch leaf that, and I'm like, have you ever seen a birch? Leaf? Right. Because none of these look like. Yeah, one. exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and and you know the shrub is deer resistant too, which I think is a you know a bonus for those people that that gardening where the deer are just driving them crazy and and whatnot. So which sometimes means it'll be resistant to your dog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or those other little furry critters, the bunnies. Um, yeah, so, and, and a good pollinator plant as well, even though, sure, the things from China, the, the butterflies and the bees will also take advantage of its nectar. Um, and the flowers, I think, are really attractive. It's not, oh, when you think of sometimes like a bridal respirea where they kind of trail down on these long tentacles, if you will. These are more little uh, rounded clusters, if you will, like little snowball clusters, almost like an aronia, if you know what an aronia looks like when they are in bloom. Uh, good early early season flower. It's just a good, it's got everything. It's got everything you want. You know, fall color, spring flower, uh, attractive summer foliage, compact habit, easy to grow. 
Um, it can tolerate some shade, but prefers full sun if you can give it that. But I've seen it do fine in, in part shade as well. And one thing with spirea, so I'm I'm fighting spirea, but I'm not fighting the spirea. I've got um, our <laughs> the people who landscaped our house um, must have been clearing out the nursery of spirea mm. because I think there was like 20, and we have a very regular sized lot. And they are just the your average pink flowering 80s spirea that has no fall color. Right. And we cut them back. Um, you know, I started out following the regular, cut them back hard every other year. That's what I was told to mm-hmm. do with them. Mm-hmm. That's not enough. I mean, I think we could cut these things back spring and fall every year. Right. Almost annually, can't and, you? Yes. Yeah. But the nice thing about that, if you are trying to incorporate woodies into also into your perennial garden, it can be nice to not have to worry, do I cut this, do I cut that, do I cut this, do I cut right. that? So spirea, just cut it. Right. Um, just, you know, cut it like your print. It will not get as big then right. as if you're trying to fill a space with a shrub, but you won't hurt it. Right. Yeah, you're right on. Is this the shrub that when you started taking them out, you found the raccoon highway behind? Um, no, that was a, a U. <laughs> <laughs> equally 80s (laughs) yes i love it that's funny yeah and and you know i taking care of some people's yards you know that they have spy the old-fashioned spireas the frobellies i think they're called and yeah i just take them to six inch stubs every spring and 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 they they rejuvenate just fine and yeah the tor spirea the tor birch leaf spirea to be honest with you i have not done any maintenance on that yet to know how well it would rejuvenate compared to the other ones um my guess is you wouldn't have to do it like the other ones i don't yeah i mean reading what it says it says cut back if overgrown Mm -hmm. after flowering and that is the one thing spirea bloom on that past growth so if you like the flowers this wouldn't be something you want to cut back in April. Right, exactly. Bingo. Yeah, immediately after flowering, tidy it up. Because sometimes spireas, you know, you'll kind of get some some dead stems mixed in with the green stuff where it's like, you know, half green and half kind of dead stems. So you're like kind of left scratching your head going, what do I do now? Um, so it, just don't even think, cut it back. But this Tor Birch Leaf Spirea... Um, hopefully will be available at your regular garden center your regular retailer um we're trying to get the word out on a, on a plant like this because it fits the bill as a great plants being overlooked and underutilized so i what i'm hearing is if you are familiar with how to do maintenance on lilacs this would be kind of similar uh, I'm no. not sure. Okay. You know, if I if I when I think about lilac maintenance, I think about that third rule: cut back. You know, remove the largest canes every year. And I don't think you would have that same opportunity with the spirea. I'm thinking it would be like something. Okay, spring is showing up. I'm out maybe cutting things back, tidying up the garden a little bit, where, where you would cut this thing back by maybe fifty percent rather than down to the ground, like tidy it up a little. I would. I mean. It wouldn't be bad to do the lilac rule. This is just going to be a lot more forgiving. You can do more cutting. Yeah, right, right. Yep. Okay. Conifer of the year. Yeah. I know this is always a tricky category. It is. Especially since we're starting to struggle with some of our conifers here, I think people could have their eye on this category for things to replace. Yeah, you're right, sir. And, and, you know, every year it gets more and more difficult to choose a conifer of the year using that that committee of folks that I count on for plant recommendations. Everybody says the same thing. Man, it's getting hard to find another conifer because if you look at our list, it's probably, what, 15 to 20 strong. And and we already have a good list of here's some great conifers for Nebraska. So it's kind of a who's who's list already, right? And so 2023 is the last year that we're going to recognize a conifer of the year for that reason. So the so this year's winner, the Korean pine, actually was nominated, oh gosh, for a number of years now by various uh conifer nerds uh evergreen people and the first person i think of is todd fowler of fowler landscape in york and uh if you've been to that nursery if you haven't been to that nursery you need to make a road trip it's right along highway 34 great nursery uh, great people there at fowler landscape and 
Todd has been touting the Korean pine for as long as I've known him, that um, it is one of the best performers for him in the York area and planting it in landscapes. And then I thank goodness for our affiliate site network. The Nebraska State Road Arboretum has affiliated arboretum sites throughout the state. And one of those gems is up in Pierce, Nebraska at Gilman Park Arboretum. And Gary Zimmer, who's since retired, um, touted that Korean pine every time we would go up there. This is just my favorite pine. It's in the white pine family. And honestly, looking at the tree, you, you almost kind of mistake it for a white pine. Um, and it, it's kind of like your, um, your pinon pine where, you know, where do we get pine nuts from, right? Those large seeded pines is where pine nuts come from. That is new information to me. <laughs> Seriously, cool. Yeah, cool. I really thought it was like a misnomer. No, <laughs> it's actually a, the the nut of a pine, believe it or not. Okay, do you want to hear something, a blonde moment I had? One time? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I was looking for a snack in the fridge. It was when I lived with my parents. I was in high school probably. And I saw a container labeled pineapple, and I went, Pines have apple. What is a yeah. pine? And then I oh, and I was like, oh my gosh, it's pineapple. <laughs> yes. Was there like an awkward space in between the two? I don't know. I just probably was tired. I don't know. Right. Some Hawaiian would say only in Nebraska would get confused about pineapple, right? You do remember we have international listeners. <laughs> so um, pine nuts are are fascinating, but we don't always see them in the wild because by the time yeah. you pay any attention to a pine cone, it's already like opened right. into the shape that you decorate in your potpourri right. bowl, which right. is, is yep. like that open pine cone. Right. But as they're growing on the tree, you'll notice all those little shingles are closed, mm -hmm. protecting the nuts or right. the, the, seed the seeds, inside. Right. which are the pine nuts. Right. Um, yeah. And, and so... As, so those cones can take two years to develop. So the, the young immature cone, the green cone stage, right, that's, that, that's all it'll get that first year. And then the second year, it'll mature even more and then open up to release those seeds that are hidden behind those little scales, right? And so a lot of pine trees, those little seeds will have a, a, a tail end attached, much like a, a helicopter tree, that the maples, right, the Samara. They have, the pine trees have that little Samara too, that little tail end, so as it's dropping down, from the tree the wind's blowing it away right distributing the seed well other pine trees say we don't need no stinking tail so they're a large seeded pine nut and so those count on birds to actually come take the seed and drop it you know whoops <laughs> dropped one some you know. launch them or launch them right which is cool <laughs> but you wonder why pine nuts are so expensive um you know you know who's going to crack that little nut and nut meat inside that thing? I don't know how they do it, but that, that's some serious labor. So, is it a misnomer because it's not a nut, or is it a nut? Yeah, good point. Yeah, it, yeah. Oh boy, Hannah, now it's. I, I, I'm not sure. Yes, it's technically. Yeah. What is? What makes? What makes a nut? Google it, Sarah. Help us out here. I have no idea. I know. The only reason I know, like all these seeds have different names, right? Because I ran, or I didn't actually ever take it over because COVID hit. But I did. Um, was planning to take over Envirothon, Forestry Street Envirothon for Nebraska mm -hmm. when I was in conservation ed. And one of the things that when I was working with the foresters on writing the exams was what type of seed does this tree have, right? Like droop or uh, right. all those different things. Mm -hmm. So I never really did understand. Like there's some that are easy to get. Oh, this is a fruit, right? Right. Apples. Right. Fruit. But what makes it a nut? I yeah, that's a good question. All right, she's got it for us. It depends who you ask. Yeah. So according to the FDA, it's a tree nut because there can be crossover in tree nut allergies. People with tree nut allergies who are allergic to like almonds can also be allergic to pine nuts. Ah. However, that same article then said, but there can also be crossover with peanuts, which is not a nut. Mm -hmm. um, taxonomically, a nut has to be a seed encased in a hard outer coating. And I don't think that fits the bill because the hard outer coating releases. But we may have to do further research. Yeah, because the pine nut, because I've seen them yeah. uh, literally being out in uh, 
Western Nebraska where the, the uh, limber a- pines after grow. After they release from the cone, do they still have a hard coating? Mm-hmm. They oh, do. Then I think they're a nut. Yeah. I can take a trip down the hall later and right? and find out. Because, yeah, because we were, <laughs> we were there visiting that small little population of limber pines. And limber pine is known as having a large nut, like a, mm-hmm. a pine nut, uh, much like the, the pinon, I think, is what's most known for pine nuts. I think commercially that's where pine nuts come from is the pinon pine, which is a... Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the limber pine, I remember looking at those cones that had already opened up and there were still some lingering nuts inside of there. Um, and I've grown limber pine from seed too. It's a, it's the nuts probably. That's what I haven't seen. I've seen the seed on the ground and I've seen the empty pine cone. Mm-hmm. But I do happen, luckily, Two doors down from my office is a dendrologist mm-hmm. who mm-hmm. studies all the different parts of trees. So I shall find out for Hit you. her up. I will. Should I just go get her? Right? <laughs> <laughs> you got a second? to class. So. You got a second? No, it's finals week. Oh, go see. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, that would be fun. No, but... Um, yeah, anyway, this Korean pine fits that bill as a, a large seeded one. There's others. One Swiss stone pine is another, uh, as, as well as the, the, the pinon and the, the North American species. So it's pretty interesting. And the Korean pine is certainly hardy for Nebraska, too. It's a solid zone four hardy. So it's, it's, a, it's an awesome tree. Okay, sorry I got us off track with pine nuts. Oh, no, I think it was a, gr- a great thing to talk about. And for I sure. love pine nuts. All right. Oh, they're awesome. <laughs> No doubt. Not quite as expensive. Well, what is more expensive, a, a pistachio nut or a pine nut? Probably pine nuts, I think. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you don't, like, eat pine nuts by the handful. Right. So, right. I mean, if you're talking about my grocery bill, pistachios. Right. But by like, an ounce, <laughs> I think it would be pine nuts. Right. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, you aren't going to snack off my pine nuts. You, this is for a recipe, thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, I've been getting into juniper berries, putting them in everything. Seriously, oh. cool. Cool, cool. I I had to stop Silas. We have a juniper growing around our trash can, and he wanted to eat the blueberries. Hmm? Oh, you should have just for his reaction. That would have been good. <laughs> I'll be honest. Most of the time I'm putting them in gin. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't, I don't think I can give him that recipe yet. <laughs> the gin says, "Welcome, <laughs> welcome, welcome one home, of, welcome home, <laughs> one of our own." <laughs> all right, should we move on to the grass of the year? Yeah. And you all confused me. Uh oh. Why do you do this to me? You tell me grass and sedge, they're right. different things, and then you make the grass of the year a sedge. Right. And uh, all I have in my head is sedges have edges. Right. <laughs> yeah, good point, Hannah. It's like, all right, man, do we? what do we call a sedge? A grass? Well, technically it's not, but the grass category was much like the conifer category, where it was really getting more difficult every year to come up with, with a grass that hasn't been promoted already. Right, because we are on a prairie technically yeah so there's a lot of grasses there is and you know and then and the great plants cumulative list i mean it's it's a big list of grasses that we already have uh listed and so yeah um and there and amongst all of those past winners of grasses of the year oh gosh just glancing at it one two three four five five were sedges already so this is a, a brand i just didn't say a brand new sedge but it's another sedge uh grass like plant you know it, you know it's it just you know getting picky picky technically uh but anyway this this blue zinger is uh Oh, uh, you know, kind of known amongst landscape professionals, um, but the the public doesn't know much about it, and and they should. And so, blue zinger is another one of those. It's non-native, but it, it doesn't seed around. It will it will spread to form a ground cover. So, what we look at this uh, wonderful little blue zinger sedge as being a lawn alternative under your shade trees. So it'll stay shorter. Yes, you can mow it once or twice a year to tidy it up if you want. But it's something that you could grow in amongst your your woodland natives or your woodland plants uh, to kind of form a, uh, an erosion proof ground cover. And so we can stop replanting the grass that does not wish to grow in the shade under right. our trees. Exactly. Exactly. So I did look it up. 
the because the confusing thing about separating grasses and, set, and sedges is it's easy to say, well, grasses have flat blades and sedges have edges, whatever. Right. Like, who cares? Yeah. In the landscape, they perform a lot of the same functions. Right. There's a few more things sedges can do than grasses. But the, like, real difference is that they're in separate families. So... You, you all know genus and species. That's what makes up the scientific name that we identify plants by. So family is the category just above genus. And grasses are in the Poaceae family. And sedges are in the Cyperaceae family. Good job, That's sir. That's the real Boom. difference. Boom. <laughs> so the sedges get lumped in with the rushes. Yes. But Not the like, limbaws, but the, the rushes. <laughs> <laughs> the garden rushes. So okay. Well, you no, know, but yeah, and uh, one thing the sedges have, really, amongst all of them, is just versatility. Mm-hmm. Um, tough, easy to grow, deer resistant, grasshopper resistant, bunny resistant, drought resistant, flood resistant. I mean, they got it all. And so. Yeah, and this and this blue zinger. What I like about it, I mean, yeah, with the seed head and stuff, it can get a couple feet high. But again, it it's it can really be mowed short, um, you know, and, and kept as a nice little low ground cover. And that name blue zinger is aptly named because the foliage is kind of blue green, gives it a nice hue. And if I remember correctly, it greens up fairly early, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. you'll get the green greenish yep. blue early on in the season darn near you you could call it semi evergreen for that reason in a protected area of your yard kind of some shade where it's not getting some desiccating winter winds it, it definitely will stay uh, evergreen i find that true of a lot of my sedges especially i mean i primarily plant them under trees and then i leave most of my leaves and they all stay green almost you know they might get brown at the tips right. and they're definitely not the vibrant summer green but right. they they keep some green all winter right right and this one reminds me of a dr seuss book i just yeah. like how it, the color yes. and how it flops and yes. flows and i just think it's it's a magical one to to put and as soon as you see it just like sprawled out under a tree you want to do the same you just want to go lay in it right the tree <laughs> or it's like I've heard it, people like petting a shaggy dog. You know, you just want to pet it, you know. Yeah, nice fine texture. Um, yeah, it's just a real easy plant to grow. Um, I'm after when people say, say I got a mature shade tree. And like you were saying, it's hard to grow turf grass underneath a, a shade tree and, and um, you know, quit trying but yet i know people that'll try to reseed grass every year because they can't get it to go underneath their shade trees well what can i do to assure my mature oak or my mature maple is going to stay healthy and i think for me it's like well i I need to eliminate that compaction and that compaction underneath the the crown of that tree is from mowing once a week you know just your just your footprints uh once a week mowing for 20 30 years you're going to have compacted soil under that tree well if you're putting ground covers like this blue zinger sedge underneath there i'm after you eliminating for the most part mowing uh all year long and then what about the leaves that drop from your tree um, you know, we're so hell bent on raking every last leaf off of our lawn. What if it covers this sedge with, with the leaves? Is it going to hurt them? No, it doesn't. So uh, the plant can actually grow right up through that, that leaf cover. So it's a way for us to landscape to do more of a meadow garden underneath the canopy of our large trees to eliminate you having to mow, have to supplement water or rake your leaves. So it's, it's perfect for the lazy gardener, which I am. I know that there are people who aren't going to like that, but I I just, sometimes I don't understand why. Like, you just sold me a garden, and you're like, you don't have to do any of the things you don't like to do. And I'm like, I'm sold. Give me some plants. Right. <laughs> I think some people do enjoy mowing. I w- took my dog for a walk on one of the nicer weekends in December, and a guy was out mowing. Yes. Uh, his grass hasn't grown in two months. Right. But he was mowing. Yes. <laughs> I had a, f- I mean, it, it's known that I don't, I think mowing is a, is a chore that must be done sometimes, and I don't have any love of it. So a, a friend sent me a meme of this person who was shot vacuuming some leaves out of their <laughs> grass, 
I mean, we don't know. It's just an internet picture. We don't know the story. They might have been something there. They really did need a shop vac. Right. But um, I, I think I know people who would shop vac leaves out of the grass. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of my other neighbors hires a landscape company, and they came and leaf blew all of the leaves out from, like, they had a good leaf litter built up underneath their shrubs and things. I was like, ooh, that's going to be great for winter. No, they, like, to the dirt, cleared it out uh, into the street and then scooped it all up to take to the landfill. Right. And that was I like just free wanted, mulch. I wanted to run and be like, stop, right. everybody stop. Yes. <laughs> I would have run after them and been like, I'll take that compost. Right. But you, <laughs> you know, can dump it in my yard. I think, one, they, they want that clean look, right? But I think, two, I think people are convinced that if you leave those leaves at the base of those shrubs, it's going to kill your shrub. I really think they think that. I just wonder how much of it is, this is how we do it. Like, this yeah, is how I learned for sure. to take care of my yard. And I know for some people, it's... This is how people know that I'm taking pride and yeah. that I am being a good neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, so just because they've always done it that way, so it, sh it needs to be done. All right. And then I think there's a lot of people who they just hired a landscape company to do fall cleanup. And that's right. the job they hired them for. And they didn't maybe ever even like really know what all that was going to entail. Right. They just knew their leaves are going to get picked up, and it would probably happen while they were away at work. Right. And then the landscape company comes and takes it down to the dust. Right. You know, and it, like you say, well, that that must be what needs to be done, yeah. right? And and the, if you didn't know better, you yeah. would you would assume that that means that job needed done. And of course, the landscape company does leave it there. Then their client is going to say, whoa, 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 you, it's it's still a mess underneath those shrubs. And that's where I think it's it's up to, if we want to change things, that landscaper has to, first of all, educate themselves. Is there a value to that stuff that's that's I have usually gotten rid of? Well, yes, there is. You know, uh, larvae, uh, beneficial insects will overwinter in that leaf litter that doesn't overwinter in grass litter. In fact, that Doug Tallamy that wrote that book, Bringing Nature Home, he talks about oak trees being the king as far as... Um, the, the larval food source for moths and butterflies, and nobody does it more than an oak. And he said, but you're wasting your time if your oak is in the middle of a grassy field or the middle of a turf grass field because all those critters that were feeding off that oak that maybe didn't get eaten by a bird uh, to fed to that bird's young, well, now uh, fall and pupate in, in that leaf litter below that oak. And if you're removing every last leaf and you're you're raking and mowing underneath that oak, it's really not doing you any good as far as, you know, um, adding to uh, the insect life. And you can buy that book now on bookshop.org slash shop slash arboretum. We have it there in our list of books. Yeah, and didn't he? He has a newer he one out, new right? One. That really focuses on oaks, if I remember uh -huh, right. Yep. Yeah, and uh, we'll get ten percent of that purchase. So, oh. if you want to support us, there's a way to do it, and you can learn more about oaks. Cool. Mm -hmm. That's my plug for the day. I like it. And then, I something I want to talk about as we go into spring. I mean, I know it's January, but for us in the plant world, like spring started last month, so right? <laughs> we're already thinking about yes. what do we need to talk it's about. It's right this around spring. the corner. We, <laughs> um, is just talk to each other. You know that whole uh, landscape company to client thing you know the client ha ha the client hires the company because they didn't know how to do the job or right. weren't physically capable and the landscape company says they hired me to do this job I'm going to do it well if we can just like take a second and talk to each other and the right. client says what jobs are involved in fall cleanup and the landscape company can tell them this is what we do and why we do it right well now we can actually you know, learn from each other and we don't do jobs out of fear of being told we didn't do it well. Right. And we don't accept work out of ignorance of, of why it's being done. Exactly. Did you listen to that podcast I told you about that was all about leaf blowers? No, I got huh? distracted because there was an episode about soil. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, you listen to that and you get back to me. It's all about leaf blower use in the U.S., which sounds terrible, but is very good. 
That's fun. <laughs> yeah, I have an electric leaf blower. I really like it, you know, and uh, I've had it for a number of years. I don't have to worry about mixing up the gas. I don't have, you know, it doesn't stink like a gas one. And it seems like those gas ones, maybe after the first year, <laughs> You try to get this thing started and it never starts. And then you take it in to get a repair. And they said, well, by the time we get this fixed, you might, it's going to cost you as much as a new one. So you might as well just buy a new one. And you're like, grr. Well, then I bought this electric one and I haven't, I'll never go back to a gas one again. Sure, I have to sometimes have a hundred foot of cord, but it's not that difficult to plug in a, you know, and it's much quieter than a, than a gas powered one. Yeah. Mine's battery operated. And the yeah. only time I use it is to get the lawn clippings off the sidewalk, right. really maybe to clean off the patio, but then I just blow everything into the garden bed. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. We have ours is battery and we use it to clean out our carport. And I'm pretty sure Nick just blows the leaves back into the, into the beds. Yeah. And I don't even think he used it enough to have to charge the battery last year. Sweet. <laughs> so I didn't really understand, <laughs> you know, when it got to fall and, and people were starting to say, think about how much leaf blower use there is. And I was like, I don't understand. Like, I can't relate to you people. I can't. I, I wasn't understanding the problem until I was driving through a neighborhood in Lincoln one day. And there was one was a lawn care company, but then two were just people out in their yards. And in like two blocks, there were five leaf blowers going and they were those big gas powered ones. And I was like, I can hear you in my car over my music. And there's a dust cloud in this neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> and what are you even right? doing? <laughs> yes. And the gas that they use is not as clean mm -hmm. as... As clean as you know. I'm sure they have <laughs> relative term. Right. But. I'm sure they have stats out there somewhere. Yeah. Of course, you know they they do with their, for the almighty lawnmower mm -hmm. and and you know what back in the 80s 90s you wouldn't have added leaf blowers to that mix of small engines ca causing problems. But yeah, that's certainly there now. Oh, they yeah they have. So I'll just say it. The podcast episode is um, flightless bird. It's all about leaf blowers. And yeah, he goes over the statistics of small engines and their, um, what they add to the climate change mm -hmm, mm -hmm. issue. And there are a few towns that are trying to outlaw those mm. and make them all electric. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So anyway, the bottom line is, is if we can create our landscapes, just like you were saying, Hannah, if I'm blowing it off my patio or off my grass into my beds that's what i do too i have a neighbor that has a huge pin oak so it's a constant leaf thing you know anybody who has a pin oak knows this um that you know it was windy today i'm pretty much sure when i go home i'm going to have leaves in my back patio again and so i keep my electric blower handy just for that reason i just blow them back into the beds and and i know they're not coming from my beds they're coming from my neighbor's tree that still has some leaves lingering on it uh and they get dislodged when it's a windy night right or windy day yeah so it's a constant battle um but yeah i have lots of areas lots of space with just leaves as mulch and it's really satisfying when you're you know you haven't had rain for a month or two and you go out there and you kind of pull the leaves back and you're maybe digging something up it, there's still moisture down here. I'll be a son of a gun. Who would have thunk it? And right now, um, when it's rain, I mean, it's winter rain, so it's not quite as warm, but right. the the decaying leaf smell in my backyard is yeah. so amazing right yeah. now, which sounds like a really disgusting thing right? to say that you like, but it just smells so, like, ready to grow. Yeah, earthy. Nice and earthy. Yeah, and you're right. And so that rain, yes, it was a winter rain. Well, we're not technically winter, but we're close. Um, well, we are now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> In real the time. The solstice is right around the corner. But anyway, uh, yeah, so, so it's very satisfying getting you know, whatever 40 hundreds of rain that can soak right in. And if you have your, your ground covered with leaves, you know it was going to be able to filter down in there rather than none of it running off. Yeah. Another... So when you talk about leaves collecting by your door, for some reason, our carport is positioned exactly in the right direction to collect the whole block's leaves right at the door we enter and exit yes. the house from. And that's in the landing between our, uh -huh. our upstairs and our downstairs. And uh -huh. our, as you know, our bunny lives downstairs. Uh. But she comes up and down. And every so often, 
I'll see her grab a leaf from by the door and hop down the stairs with it and Seriously? go hide it in her little house. That's and great. she'll just be back there nibbling on this little leaf she found. Like That's great. I found some nature. Right. I'm going to eat it. <laughs> the best part is, though, if you tried to give that to her or take her outside, oh, yeah. she would lose it. Yeah. She wants nothing to do with being taken outside, and if I tried to give that leaf to her as a treat, she would turn her nose up. But since she she captured it, that's funny. <laughs> it was a wild. <laughs> that's cool. That's great. All right, so I think we have talked about all of our great plants of 2023. We hope that you will check some of them out. Maybe plant a few. Come and find us if you want to talk about them. Or maybe you have a plant that you think is underutilized. I've been trying to get Bettany on the list, but mm. nobody will <laughs> listen to me. So <laughs> there we go. That's my pitch. Poor Bettany. <laughs> yeah, which Bettany did you... Humella? Is that... Uh, the... I mean, well, I'll oh, look humolo, it up. Humolo. Humolo. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's an awesome plant. I yeah. love that plant. Sarah asks us, what should I put in bloom box this year? And I've said it every year, and she goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been Every denied. year you better have humolo in there. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool plant, and I learned about it from the purple polos of Kinghorn Gardens. They had planted a bunch of it um, in combination with an allium. And I was, like, looking at this stuff going, what am I looking at? Dang, that's cool. And so I emailed them to say, what is this? And that's when I learned about Humolo. And, and I've asked them since, is it, is it rock solid hardy? Is it, you know, um, drought tolerant, dependable? What about pollinators? And check, check, check. And it, yeah. it fits all the bills. I have mine in my house strip in my garden. It's been there for like three years now. I have had zero problems with it. It attracts pollinators. There's always stuff on it. Stay, it's pretty much evergreen as well. Nice. It bloomed three times last year. Wow. Uh, which was fun. It's the plant that I get the most questions about mm-hmm. in my garden. Mm-hmm. And like I said, hell strip, no problems. Mm-hmm. Hasn't had a single issue. Cool, cool. Meaning you're not babying this thing. It's like, yeah, oh, you're on no, your own. No. Yeah, <laughs> yes. they're all on their own. Yeah, cool, mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, the allium that they had it combined with is relatively new in the trade too, folks. And that one is called Summer Beauty. I had not heard of Summer Beauty, and it's aptly named. There's some some later blooming alliums out there in the gardening world. One's Mongolian Gem, which happens to be a great plants release. Mongolian Gem, eh, the, the, the color's kind of a pale pink, not that loudly showy. But this Summer Beauty has a really pretty flower. It's very similar to that allium that's very popular now called Millennium, mm-hmm. except it blooms probably, oh, three weeks earlier than Millennium. So it's just good july august bloomer okay was bettany your your plant on your mind or yeah do you right. want to add sure. one okay. <laughs> it seems to be very heavily on your mind right <laughs> i can take a hint <laughs> yes okay. so do you want to go first bob or should i do you need oh man a you better go first okay. i gotta think about this so mine is my entire herb garden <laughs> yeah, right. My herb garden's on my mind. <laughs> because, so my herb garden is at the top of a retaining wall. And so it's it's very Perfect. well drained. Yeah. It stays a little bit warm. Um, and it's right outside my, do- my kitchen door, which is like the best you could ever mm-hmm. plan. And it's pretty much freeze dried. So I'm still going out and picking some thyme or some, I actually, some things I like cut back really far because I was drying it. But I've got thyme and winter savory left. Got a little bit of rosemary, but you know, we bring our rosemary pots into the greenhouse. So right. I can go down there and harvest right. that fresh. Yes, I took the dead one out of my office. Yes, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm just like, <clears throat> it's Herbs. the middle of winter and I'm still loving my herb garden. No Which doubt. Is great. Yeah, you know, and uh, I could kind of stick to that with time. Time is on my mind, man. I, I, I need more time. And really, one of my favorite thyme plants is lemon thyme. Oh, I just mm-hmm. love that plant. And I just went out. We had kind of a, a soup lunch today, and the recipe called for uh, three or four fresh thyme sprigs. And I'm like, boom, I could still go out in the garden and, and pluck three or four fresh thyme sprigs, even though they had seen, what, temperatures in the teens already? Yeah. And so the leaves, I just kind of let the leaves blow in that area of the garden that I have. 
and resist raking them. I just let them blow in around and they pretty much have covered the thyme plants. And then if we get some strong, windy, desiccating winds, because that's usually what will do a thyme or a, a lavender in, is those desiccating winds. Otherwise, they're pretty much evergreen, right? And so you let those leaves alone and it'll, it'll kind of protect it so that it doesn't get winter burned or, you know, die over the winter yeah i think my retaining wall helps with that too because it's a it's a concrete retaining wall and then it's over our driveway and it it really does stay kind of warm in there so yeah. it it helps with that and then yeah i let the leaves blow in and then i just kind of fluff them off and look for what i'm i right. need to cook with today and, no. and put them back heck yeah so time is on our mind yep uh, all right. I think I think we've talked about a lot of plants today. Yeah, and, and, you know, the thing about the great plants for the great plants, holy moly, we could talk. If we went through every darn one of these that is on this list, it's a it's a big cumulative list, folks. So so get your hands on that publication. You'll be glad you did. And and I know people that have that have really kind of made it a goal to try to get all of the great mm -hmm. plants recommendations in their garden. Good luck. You're going to need a pretty big garden to be able to get all those recommendations in there. But if you did that, you're an accredited <laughs> arboretum, right? Because <laughs> all those trees will right? get you there. Exactly. Heck, even if you just did the perennials and the grasses, that would be a, a pretty substantial garden. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to put you on the spot. What is your favorite great plant, either perennial of the year mm. or release through the program? About 95% of them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking, and I think, honestly, I think one of my favorites is that clove currant. Uh-huh. Cool. Uh, I just like, I, I love everything about it. You've got fruit, and I love currants. Um, I remember taking my, my fruit science class in, as an undergrad and tasting currant juice for the first time. And I was like, where can you get this? And yes. the professor said, one store in Lincoln, which has now burned down. Oh. Um, what store was that? Uh, it was that kind of local produce-y place on hmm. A by that sew and vac Raymond. Hmm. So, like oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There used to be a store there, but that didn't burn down. The Paramount. Oh, it did burn down. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hmm. But it was closed. Oh, oh it was already I, closed. Not and, ideal. And, and, and so it was a little suspect, but I think everyone was cleared. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah, ideal. Yes, ideal, ideal okay. grocery. And um, so now I need I need room for a current bush. But then this one, like this. The flowers have like a spicy scent yes. to them. Yes. And then it has fall color. And like, I just don't know what else you want out of right. a plant. <laughs> Yummy fruit, fall color, spicy yep. flowers. <laughs> yep. And, and you know, there's, there's a selection out there called Crandall, which was actually selected, I read, in Kansas, like in the late 1800s. So it was, it was selected way, way... No, Crandall is that old. Yeah, is that wow. old. And it basically disappeared from the trade. And so that, the great thing about the Great Plants Program is kind of revitalizing, revitalizing something that used to be popular. And it was popular because it was something we could eat as an edible landscape. Probably one of my favorites, there's so many great perennials of the year, but uh, the dwarf blue indigo, I think... Yeah. We, we at the State Red Arboretum, I remember first learning about that plant back when I worked at the state fairgrounds, and I was like, I knew the blue indigo, the Baptisia australis, but I didn't know this dwarf one, and I just thought, so what? Who would want a little miniaturized version Everyone. of the bigger one, right? Everyone. <laughs> I need to do a count of how many of those I've distributed through Bloombox. It's right? in the thousands. That's cool. That's cool because if you look it up online, the, the, the dwarf blue indigo, the little Baptisia minor, is only native to Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri. And of those three states where it's only native to in the world, is small populations. I mean, we're talking. I didn't realize. That. Yeah, we're talking. I figured it was wider spread. No, maybe one, one or two counties in Nebraska, one or two counties in Kansas, and one or two counties in Missouri, and that's it in the world. Well, it does, it does struggle a little bit more out west. We can send Australis out there, but right. to western Nebraska, the minor, that's the little a, guy doesn't do as well. That's a bummer. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean. That's really, I think that's pretty limited to the Western Panhandle. I can send it pretty far. Such a cool plant. So many plants, so little time. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, everybody, for listening. We appreciate it. Don't forget to rate and review us everywhere you're listening. It really helps. Send in your questions. If you are listening to us talk about these plants and you're just like, what? I don't understand. Send us questions. We'll be happy to help you out. As always, Bloombox and Bloombox Growing Deeper are both programs of the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. We have an update. We're here with the nut situation. Update. We (laughs) did the research. Well, we didn't. We asked somebody else, too. So I asked our resident dendrologist, Ann Powers. She teaches dendrology here at the university, and she's my office neighbor. Uh, she, you might remember her from episode 10, our interview with a scientist. She did her master's research on Bloombox. So mm-hmm. check that episode out if you have not listened. But uh, we, we had to do some research. She pulled some books off her shelf. They were very big books. <laughs> we determined that we're going to go with the definition of a nut as a dry, indehiscent fruit with a hard pericarp usually derived from a two or more carpaled ovary. There are so many words I don't know. (laughs) Okay. So what that means is every seed, most seeds are hard, right? Like there's not very many squishy seeds. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go with that. But that's just the seed coat. Right. So every seed has a seed coat. If you take an apple seed, the black is the seed coat. Mm -hmm. If you bite into the apple seed, the white inside... Which I don't eat apple seeds usually. Wouldn't do that. But it's a good example because it's it's a really clear. It's black on the outside. Yeah. And it's white inside. Yes. The white is the baby plant mm-hmm. and its food, the embryo. Okay. So most seeds have a seed coat of some kind, but nuts have an extra hard layer that right. does not crack open unless you make it to crack open with a rock. Yes, or a nutcracker, or a squirrel. Sometimes you can get squirrels to do that for you. (laughs) So, (laughs) (laughs) by that definition, this gets even more complicated. Not all pine nuts look the same, but the ones that we eat, the big seeded pines, like Mm -hmm. Bob was talking about. Mm They do. I'm going to share some pictures because it's very clear in the pictures that they're a nut with that hard outer casing that doesn't open until we crack it. Okay. But then we talked about some that have the little tail like a maple helicopter. Mm-hmm. Those would not be nuts. And It's a seed. Yeah. And when I asked... But nuts are seeds. Nuts have seeds in them. <laughs> <laughs> this feels like an SAT question. <laughs> <laughs> they also have to be dry. So according to this definition of walnut, because it has the goo on the outside of it, uh-huh. it doesn't fit this definition. So is it a fruit? It is a, the walnut. That is the fruit. That's the ovary that turns into that soft outer part uh-huh. of the walnut. That got more complicated than we need to. We're going to back up to the pine nuts. Okay, sorry. We're going to have to do a whole episode on <laughs> I. That's what I was thinking. After I asked her this, I was like, we need to do like... A seed episode. Seed. Like, where do baby plants come from? For Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, now you know. As far as we could tell from our research and our consultation of the experts, some pine nuts are truly nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and we are <laughs> and signing Anna off. <laughs> most definitely is truly nuts. <laughs> So basically, we've taught you nothing. (laughs) Some (laughs) things are nuts. Some things are not. We don't know why. What we've taught you (laughs) is that plant classification's difficult. And I started reading this article that went all the way back to Linus and Pliny the Elder. And then I started getting really confused. And then I just went and asked Anne. So pictures in the show notes. And final thing is some pine nuts are nuts. Some are not. Yes. All of them are are delicious. Mm -hmm. Eat some hummus. Wonderful. Okay.